sorry, my, my watch strap was clicking and it was really annoying me. Like these bracelets, they just click a little bit and it really irritates me. Anyway, video time. <laughs> Hi, Jimmy here, and you find me in a weird place. I mean, I'm not in a weird place, I'm in a lovely place, um, but I am in a weird place because I just watched a very strange TV series. So this video is about The Winter King, and The Winter King is a TV series based off a series of novels, and the series of novels are the Warlord novels, the first of which is The Winter King by Bernard Cornwell. Mighty is he! And Bernard Cornwell's novels are historical fiction, and they're always great fun. They're always page turners. They've always got characters you, you love to hate and you hate to love, and gosh darn it if you don't want them to do well for themselves. And this series is no different. I read the Warlord series when I was in undergrad, and absolutely love them. Like, I, I horsed through them. And they're really good fun. They're set in Arthurian Britain. They're set in sub-Roman Britain. And you have all your favourite Arthurian characters, like Arthur and Mervyn. Um, in the books, he is Merlin rather than Mervyn, but that's fine. Uh, you have um, Uther. You have some of the Knights of the Round Table. I think we have Kai and Bors and um, Betwyr in the novels, and various other people as well. And the main character and the narrator of the novels is Dervel, and Dervel is this aging warrior who becomes a monk, and he writes down all the stories that are the narrative arc of the novels. It's great fun. And a TV series has been made, and I wasn't actually aware of this TV series being made uh, until I spotted it on Bernadette's list of things that she wants to talk about in her end of year review. So Bernadette Banner does an end of year review of TV and film costuming and she has very kindly invited me on to talk about that so keep your eyes peeled on Bernadette's channel for that. But I had a little look around and found that as I am traveling in North America I am able to access the network, the streaming network, where you can watch this. And so I figured, hey, let's give it a shot and see how it is. Speaking of North America, this might interest you. <laughs> Hilarious. Oh, hi. Didn't see you come in. Please join me. You just find me relaxing in front of this wonderful fireplace, comfortable and confident in the knowledge that my work laptop is protected because I've got NordVPN right on there. NordVPN, I hear you say, don't they sponsor all of those big, cool YouTube channels? Why, yes. Yes, they do. And now they're on mine. This video is, in fact, brought to you in collaboration with NordVPN, who have been really cool, actually, and given me some free months on a membership. And you, too, could have four months free on a two-year plan with NordVPN by going to www.nordvpn.com forward slash Welsh and using the code Welsh at checkout. But what is a VPN? I hear you cry. Let me tell you, a VPN is a virtual private network that helps to protect you from things like phishing scams and password attacks and malware, that kind of stuff. All those sorts of things that bad people on the internet really want to do to your computer. And they can take all kinds of data and breaches can happen. Remember all those breaches of things like MySpace and Yahoo Mail? Yeah, VPNs can help prevent that. As illustrated by this attractive graphic they've let me use, NordVPN can also allow you to access streaming services from other regions. So, for example, if you wanted to watch a TV series like The Winter King, which is only available in the United States, you could tell your laptop that it is in the United States, even though it is, for example, in Canada or the United Kingdom. It's jolly clever stuff, and it's all possible with NordVPN. So, Grab yourself four months free on a two-year plan with NordVPN by going over to nordvpn.com forward slash Welsh and using the code Welsh when you check out. And then you too can lounge in front of a delicious fireplace reading... That book is in a language that I do not read. Go to NordVPN. Get VPN'd. So while I was here, I, I figured I would watch it, and I have now watched the entire first series, the first season. And that's always the thing that trips me up, because I always say first series, because I was brought up with the British way of, of calling it a first series, and then a second series, and then 
in North American English, they say first season. Anywho, you don't care about that. You care about how terrible this is. But there are some good aspects to it. There's some beautiful cinematography in this TV adaptation. The landscapes are fantastic and they're well shot and they are shot to their fullest advantage. And it's, it's easy to say, oh, it looks pretty because the landscape's pretty. And it's filmed in Wales. And my homeland is one of the most beautiful places in the world. And I'll fight you if you say different. But they do a superb job of it. They make it look really good. There are some scenes set in the winter, it's the Winter King, and some of the wintry scenes I feel like I am there walking across a moil in Banabrechinog National Park, feeling chilly and, and smelling the landscape around me. It was really, really evocative and it made me a little bit homesick. Um, but there, I kind of go from the positive bread of the sandwich to the negative meat because ugh, I went in open-minded. I promise I went in open-minded. I went in really hoping that it would have some, some real depth to it, that it would be an honest adaptation of the novels. A lot of Cornwell fans were hugely disappointed with the Last Kingdom TV series. I understand why. I've read the series myself and it does not respect the books. It diverts from the books, it diverges from the books hugely, and you'd think lessons would have been learned from Game of Thrones. <laughs> Ooh, it's not, it's not faithful to the material in the books at all, either in, neither in plot nor in character. And we have, we have scenes, for example, between Arthur and Merlin in Armorica, in modern day Brittany, where Merlin's character is shown to be extremely different from how he is in the books. In the books, he is this, this lascivious, lecherous, weird anti-hero of a character. And he, he has his own games that he's playing and he meddles in politics if he gets him his way. And he is portrayed as this honorable, mystical character so far in the first series. He seems a lot less fun. He's a lot less fun. He, he he kind of does fulfill an unfortunate trope um, in certain ways, and it, it's disappointing. There's also a disappointment here because we've lost the Dervel narrative. This is very much Arthur's story. It's called The Winter King and it's set in Arthurian Britain, therefore we're following King Arthur. And that's boring now. We've had so many of those where we follow Arthur or we follow Merlin in the TV series, in the BBC series, Merlin, which is fantastic and it's super silly, but it's got a kind heart and we love it. And this feels a lot more like it's just another Last Kingdom, which is another Vikings. It's dark and everybody's grumpy and everybody's brooding all the time. There's so much brooding in this series. It's incredible how much brooding there is in this show. It's, it's disappointing on that level. I am a fan of the book, so it's disappointing that the characters don't work like that. Some of the plots are changed to be almost unrecognisable. And the thing that jarred for me most, surprising to some regular viewers, wasn't the costuming. What jarred me the most was the pronunciations. So we have a lot of Welsh people. Mana Llwyth o Gymru ar An Actio and Rhaglen Arteolir Lens. And considering the number of very Welsh names and very Welsh people involved in this project, there is a lot of mispronouncing and it's inconsistent mispronouncing. Dervel, our main character in the novels, in series one of this show, he's not the main protagonist. It's very much Arthur's show. It is pronounced Dervel, I think once. It's Dervel, it's Derful, which is one F is a V in Welsh, we know this, it's basic, basic stuff. So the name's mispronounced. The main fortress where things take place is Caer Catarn, or Caer Catarn. And Dervel, incidentally, is Dervel Catarn in the books. He's Dervel the Mighty, he's this, this aged but strong warrior. He's fought with Arthur right the way through his campaigns. And in the TV show, we have Caer Cadarn. And Caer Cadarn is quite simply not how you pronounce Caer Catarn. It's just not the way you emphasize the syllables. If you can't roll your R's, you could at least 
try to pronounce it properly and consistently. There are, that I've counted, three separate pronunciations. We have one Kair Katarn from a character who is canonically North African. We have Kaya Kadan and we have Kar Kadan. That's mad to me. The idea that we have directors and we have exec producers and we have script editors and we have rehearsals and we have table reads should iron out people who are from this place, who live in this place, not pronouncing it consistently. That is utterly bamboozling to me. We hear old English spoken, which is kind of fun, but equally, I'm pretty sure you don't pronounce this Aieli. I could be wrong here, but I'm fairly sure that Aieli, or Aieli, isn't the way you pronounce this. Anglo-Saxonists, like, let me know in the comments. So there's a, there's a lot of mispronunciation, there's a lot of confusion in some of it as well, I think. Um, like at, at one point, we have, um, Tristan, who is a prince of Cornwall, Kerniv, in Brittany. And I'm fairly sure at one point it's implied that he is a prince of Cornwall, Kerno, in the southwest of what is now England. Like, I'm fairly sure that's implied at one point, which is wrong to the material and also a funny, um, a funny confusion because it happens all the time. Because there is a Kerniv in Brittany, in Armorica. There is a Cornouai in modern-day Brittany, and of course that is cognate with Kernu or Kerno and Cornwall in the southwest of Britain. So that is funny. The costume is not great. I'm not going to lie. The costuming is par for the course from shows like Last Kingdom and Vikings. All of the men are basically dressed in black leather with bits riveted through the black leather. Even King Arthur, even Arthur is just wearing it looks like they pulled it from the sh from the store of what was available from Vikings and the Last Kingdom. Like they, they they do not do anything interesting with the costumes, as far as I'm concerned. Most of the colour is either black or this weird washed out turquoise, and that's what made me think that they were pulling a lot of this from Vikings because in Vikings a lot of the clothing and Last Kingdom is this weird washed out turquoise colour, and a that's not really a colour I'd expect to see lots of people wearing in the period. Um, B, it looks so dull, it's so drab, and there is a scene where we have Dervel, sorry, Durfel, where Durfel is having a very intimate conversation, and the colours in this one scene, it was the only scene of this entire season of television where I thought, like, that looks like the colour palette I would expect here at this time of year because it's, it's golden leaves and the browns of the trees and the lighter timbers of, of freshly cut timber for new built structures. And then there is a red, there's like brick red, there's deep orange, there's golden yellows of hanks of yarn being dried on a drying rack that's just been freshly dyed with plant dyes. That was, that was so nice to see. Everything else, like you could, you could literally turn the colour off on your TV, on old TVs where you could turn the colour off so you could have black and white TV so you'd feel comfortable and homely again because you're old and weird. You could literally do that for every other scene in this show and you wouldn't lose a thing. Like you wouldn't lose a thing from it. There's so much is just monochrome. Beyond the black leather and that kind of thing, everybody's wearing t-shirts and pants, which is weird because one of the things that I think I discussed with Bernadette last year was people are afraid of changing waists on men in TV shows. Like people are afraid to give men a waist at the natural waist, right? Trousers set, sit on the hips, t-shirt length clothing. There's so much t-shirt length clothing and, and hip height trousers in this show. At one point, he kind of looks like he's cosplaying me on a casual day, which is very, very strange and very, very unsettling and I didn't like it at all. Um, I don't even know how to describe what this is. Like these guys are just like a Wes Anderson fever dream that turned up on set one day and every now and then we just get a shot of them brooding, um, holding quite a nice looking Viking Age sword hilt. But this is very, very, very much not the kind of sword hilt that we would be seeing here. This is from like 400, 500 years later. Not what we're looking for. We are looking for more stuff like this, which is maybe Khaled Vulch, sorry, Excalibur. And if it is, it's cool that they went with a Roman style hilt 
on it and a Roman style pommel. It's cool that it's bone, looks like bone and brass. Um, the tablet weave around it is a fun touch. Why do people not have tablet weave? Why is Owain wearing rope accessories? Like, what's going on with the rope, guys? Um, there's an unspoken ancestral sword storyline going on here where Arthur at one point picks up what looks like a much older sword and then it's it's rehilted and 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 put into this um this roman furniture which is kind of cool like it's cool that this updates this the sword is being updated something much truer to the period that's pretty much all that looks true to the period um the clothing for most other people is like bland washed out t-shirts um impractical looking stuff like the clothing looks impractical even on peasant characters which is a shame um, there's this weird 1930s thing happening at one point. I don't know why the priest is wearing a crombie. Like, he is fully wearing a crombie. Those cut-out lapels that he's wearing, that popped lapel, that is in fashion now. This is a modern coat. This is a fully modern coat. If I walked down a high street and, uh, like, a classy clothing district somewhere in a big city in London or in New York, I would expect to see something similar to this. This is not a sub-Roman garment. And when it came on the screen and he swaggered up to the camera wearing it, it just rocketed me out of my immersion. It just fully catapulted me through the window and I hate it and it's awful. Like the weapons, when you see them, you see them very, very briefly. In the trailer, we get a shot of some nice round shields, men holding spears, and this is what I've been crying out for. Maybe they watch my videos, but we have men wearing helmets, holding shields, forming a shield wall. And there is an episode called The Shield Wall, which is nice, and I hope that there's more battles that look like people know how to actually fight. There is a duel between Arthur and Owain, uh, in which it's black leather everywhere. And at one point, Owain starts singing Summer is a Coming In, Sumeri Sakomin in, which is like a late medieval English folk song. Why would a wine, a Britonic royal, fighting tooth and nail against a Saxon incursion, sing this Middle English? In fact, I think it's early modern English folk song. It's the one that they sing at the end of The Wicker Man, and I was kind of wishing I were in the Wicker Man by the end of the series, but still. It was a very strange choice. The rope. What's with the rope accessories? Rope gets very hard and very heavy when it's wet, so this seems like an extremely impractical thing. Like, you'll cut your arms to ribbons if you just wear rope around your clothes. Anyway, the clothing is bad. The women's clothing, also bad. Flowy dresses, everywhere. Um, one of the only male characters who wears a tunic is Merlin. And he lives in what appears to be a mud brick tower um, of a style I would expect to find in North Africa. We do have a canonically North African character, as I mentioned. I do not know if they have tried to make Merlin canonically North African as well. The racists have already been out in droves because there are black characters. There is a character of um, South Asian heritage in here as well. Um, there is a, an actor of, of East Asian heritage, and we have North African characters, we have Hispanic characters. Shut up. Nobody cares. It's sub-Roman Britain. It was an incredibly diverse place, the Roman Empire, amazingly enough. But why is he living in a weird mud brick tower? Why is a... Um, oh my god, I organised one. What is it called? Cremation funeral happening in... That was dark. Why is a cremation happening in the top of a tower that has a solid roof? That is an incredibly bad idea. Don't do that. Don't ever do that. That's a terrible idea. Um, why is a Christian funeral happening in what looks like the ballroom of a hotel? Like, this is very strange. One of the buildings looks good, and that's um, Kair Katarn. Sorry. Kaya Kadan. Um, so, Kakdan, or however you want to pronounce it, just trample over my language and culture, who cares? Nobody else seems to. Anyway, K 
Caer Catarn is clearly a repurposed Roman villa that's been fortified, and I think that's really cool. That is a cool idea, because we know Roman buildings were being repurposed, we know Roman building material was being repurposed, and we have a couple of shots of the exterior that looks really cool. We've got amphorae next to the door, and we've got the crisscross Roman windows, just to really drive home, like, this is a reused Roman building. It is bland, grey-coloured, which seems unlikely for the period, but ignore that for now, just, and it's, yes, it's exceptionally dark inside and we could very easily illuminate it better, but don't worry about that. All of the insides of the buildings look like dark, dank caves. Also, did I mention, there are dark, dank caves underneath this Roman villa for some reason. Wine storage? But um, beyond that exterior shot of Caer Catarn, the buildings don't look great, what buildings we have don't look great. For some reason, one of the gatekeepers is a conquistador, so he's there in his weird 16th century helmet for some reason. Eagle-eyed viewers may remember those being used in Vikings and also The Last Kingdom, hence my imagining that they probably pulled the costumes from them. Overall, as a fan of the books, it is disappointing to see another unfaithful fairly unoriginal looking adaptation of a Bernard Cornwell series. It is, especially in this period after um, Eggers' The Northman, where we have really good costuming for the most part. We have really good set design and props for the most part in that movie. And like I said, that is the most accurate Viking film we have had to date. And it's really, really done a great job. And I and a lot of other costume people and a lot of other reenactors were hoping that this would then start a trend and it would change the trend um, of just black leather, silly looking costumes in historical dramas, but maybe we're not quite there yet, maybe we need a little bit more. It, the book series, when they first came out, were really, really lauded and applauded for how they show everyday life in sub-Roman Britain. And that was mostly because of the the quarrelling between Christians and uh, both Anglo-Saxon and Britonic pagans. And frankly, with the research we now have, it's, it's misrepresenting it, I think. Um, as far as I'm aware, it's not an accurate representation of the way the religious um, dynamics of the period would have worked. But, yeah. It's not my favourite thing to watch. I will not be sorry to lose access to it when I go back to the UK. But if you want to give it a watch, give it a watch. I'm pretty sure that some of the people in my Discord are going to be going off about this series. You know who you are. Uh, and if you would like to join that going off session on my Discord, or you would just like to um, support the channel financially in any way, of course, we have the Patreon link in the description. We have the coffee link if you want to just chuck me a couple of quid to buy me a coffee or a pint to recover after the show then by all means do so thank you so much to all of my patrons by the way this week you have um you've literally kept me alive this last month once again you're absolute legends you are helping me to 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 stay alive so thank you so much i really appreciate you um and thank you to everyone who's watching thank you so much for joining me have a lovely time watching this show. And until the next time, Tanatronessa, Hulvaur, Tara.